Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bill Foster. I'm president of the Vancouver Island Criminal Justice Association. And it's my job to welcome you here tonight, uh, provide a couple of uh, uh, opening comments and uh, uh, to introduce the, uh, our moderator for tonight. This is one of a series of uh, forums that the Vancouver Island Criminal Justice Association has put on since uh, 2009 and uh, involving areas that are what we perceive to be critical to social and, criti and criminal justice here in Vancouver Island. We're associated, affiliated with the BC Criminal Justice Association and uh, the national organization, the Canadian Criminal Justice Association, whose Congress you'll see pamphlets for their annual meeting, annual Congress or biannual Congress uh, which is taking place October 2nd through 5th this year at the Hyatt Regency in Vancouver. So we'd, uh, we'd uh, suggest that you pick up a, uh, a pamphlet and, uh, and consider, uh, consider that event, which is attracting international speakers and uh, is one of the premier events, uh, uh, criminal justice events in this country. I also want to uh, point out that our funding for these uh, forums has been provided um, by the Law Foundation of BC. Uh, that funding uh, terminates at the end of June, unfortunately, due to funding cuts that they've received. So we're uh, encouraging membership in the Canadian Criminal Justice Association and, and our association because our future funding is going to depend probably on the success of that Congress I mentioned in October. Um, so that we can continue to, to uh, go ahead with, uh, with these forums. Our moderator tonight is uh, Professor Rob Gordon, who is the uh, director of the School of Criminology at Simon Fraser University. He's also director of the International Cyber Crime Research Center <coughs> and a member of the board of directors of the Center, Center for, for Forensic Research, an associate member of the Department of Gerontology at Simon Fraser, Chair of the Gerontology Research Center Advisory Committee, and a Distinguished Fellow of the Canadian Center for Elder Law at the University of British Columbia. There's a lot more here, but I'm going to, I'm going to skip to the stuff that pertains to us particularly. Dr. Gordon's first career was in police in England, Hong Kong, and Australia, and he's maintained an interest in police organization and administration and policing practices. He's currently a member of the Council of Canadian Acad Academies expert panel on conducted energy weapons, which will release a major report on health impacts of the use of such weapons later this year. Our moderator, Professor Rob Gordon. Thank you. My uh, first task actually is to introduce the, the real meat uh, of the event, which are the, the three speakers, or who are the three speakers to my right. And I've just walked away from my little script, so give me a moment here. <laughs> All right, to my uh, immediate right is uh, Randy Wilson, um, who is currently... Um, the operations officer for the Southeast District based in, I'm sorry, I beg your pardon, who is the island district commander overseeing policing on Vancouver Island and the Gulf Islands. My apologies for that. No uh, I was there before. The <laughs> you were indeed. <laughs> oh, Chief Wilson has an um, extensive uh, background in policing, as you might imagine, extremely varied. Um, and uh, I look forward to hearing what he has to say about issues relating to regionalization and amalgamation in the context of, uh, of BC. Um, I'm truncating this because I feel the need to make sure there's time to have the conversation uh, with the speakers. Next is uh, Chief Constable Paul Haynes of the Central Saanich Police Service, uh, formerly um, an RCMP officer who came to Vancouver Island in 1999 as Chief Constable for Central Saanich. Um, Paul has uh, 
uh, a number of degrees, including a mu an interesting master's thesis. I must try and get hold of a copy of this because it's uh, entitled um, Building Bridges, Future Policing on the Sarnich Peninsula. Um, I assume that was done at Royal Roads. Uh, is that right? Yeah, okay. So we'll see if we can track that down. And um, far right is uh, Jamie Graham. Uh, again, extensive background in, in policing, RCMP, senior RCMP officer, and then uh, the chief of the uh, Vancouver Police Department and currently the chief of the Victoria Police Department uh, since 2008. Um, so we've got a some folks here who have a wealth of policing experience at the organizational and administration levels, and in, in addition to um, hands-on uh, policing. I uh, was asked to open by simply providing a bit of a primer for folks who might not be familiar with some of the issues around the changing structure and organization of policing in BC. Now, I, I'm sensitive to the fact that there will be a number of people here uh, who are very well acquainted with that. If that is the case, if you're one of the initiated, could you please uh, sleep quietly uh, to allow others who are not so initiated to, uh, to hear what's being said? And a little um, presentation for you. Um, I was asked to just basically summarize the current situation. And, and bear in mind, we're doing this in, in the context of uh, what's often referred to as the Great White Whale, which is the, um, the Moby Dick of policing uh, in BC. It's the, the spectre of, of amalgamation and regionalization, which uh, is dubbed a whale because it has a habit of, of uh, swimming at depth for quite a while, surfacing, spouting, and then disappearing again. Um, it has been doing that systematically for about the last 20 years, and uh, I, I know that Jamie and I have had numerous uh, conversations about how to harpoon the beast, um, but it, um, it, it is an intriguing issue because it's, for many people, so obviously needed and yet so difficult uh, to obtain. Uh, and there are a number of barriers to, to it, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to identify and discuss some of those uh, this evening. Um, right now, the... White whale is very much on the surface, uh, I think primarily because of uh, Mr. Justice Opal's report uh, into the missing women uh, debacle in, in Metro Vancouver and the numerous um, recommendations that flowed, flowed from that, including a recommendation that was heavily endorsed and advanced by the Vancouver Police, Depa Vancouver Police Department, which was that uh, there was a dire need for a regional police service of some kind in Metro Vancouver, and that if that had been in place uh, when Picton began his antics, uh, there probably wouldn't have been so many deaths. As simple as that, straightforward, one-sentence statement um, that I, I think is extremely telling. Um, <clears throat> so it's against this backdrop that we need to, I think, just briefly consider where we're sitting at the moment with policing in the province. Um, there are, as you can see, three main levels of policing. Number one is the, is the federal level of policing, indisputably undertaken by the RCMP. Uh, it is a particular business line within their mandate, and it includes things like uh, border integrity. Um, and generally, I think it would be fair to say, around the national policing issues, so the, the broad sweep of uh, policing requirements that covers, for example, organized crime, uh, drug interdiction, and so on. That's a federal uh, domain. Um, it's uh, critical to the safety of Canada. We've just seen a good example of how that plays out in Ontario with the apprehension of a number of individuals associated with terrorism. The next level is um, provincial policing. And across Canada, every province uh, has some kind of uh, provincial arrangement. Uh, as you probably well know, in Ontario and Quebec, for example, uh, that's provided, that's provincial policing organized and delivered by the provinces. In this province, uh, we have a contractor, and that contractor is the RCMP, um, currently uh, sitting with a 20-year contract 
that was renewed last year. RCMP have been our provincial police service uh, since 1950. There's interesting stories about how it came to be. I, I won't bore you with them tonight, but uh, they're, they're, worth, they're worth following through on. Um, the next level is, of course, the municipal level of policing. Uh, if you happen to live in a municipality with 5,000 people or less, then you become part of the uh, provincial policing contract and, and your policing needs are met by the RCMP. For those over 5,000, you may or may not have a contract with the, with the RCMP. Um, you may have your own police service, which of course is the situation here in, um, in Victoria and in a number of other municipalities on the peninsula. And I think that's part of the reason why people are concerned about the, um, the organisation of policing in this particular part of BC. There are a number of other uh, police services that you'll be familiar with. Um, transit is a, a growing uh, police service in the metro area. Um, and there are uh, you know, railway police, there's First Nations uh, police service, tribal police if you like, um, in another part of the province. Um, the independent um, investigation office, by the way, is um, considered to be a police service for uh, the purposes of legislation in BC. It's a indisputably provincial responsibility to provide effective policing uh, across the province. They have a duty to do it. It's very clearly prescribed in the Police Act. Um, that means that it's, uh, it's enforceable uh, in the courts. Of course, we're not interested, or um, the province is not interested in the federal jurisdictions. It is uh, only matters that are within the purview of the province. They can and do contract. And interestingly enough, you look at the Act, you, the, the provincial government quite clearly has the power to override the policing arrangements and decisions about policing that occur in the larger municipalities. So in the event uh, the, the uh, provincial government decided that a, an amalgamated police service was necessary in, uh, in Victoria, in Greater Victoria, Metro Victoria, and there was a police service that, uh, that pushed back against that, and notwithstanding the political consequences, uh, the province could enact that those police services amalgamated, including those who objected to doing it. Um, just a refresher that the current contracts that were all signed up in April of last year, actually earlier than that, but they were effective in April 2012, they're all um, contracts that can be terminated with two years' notice on either side. A great deal of fuss was made about this at the time. It's exactly the terms and conditions you found or would find in the previous contract. There's nothing, nothing new there. Um, so, Victoria... Um, or one of the other, or I should say, one of the police services in the, um, in the Metro Victoria area that's receiving services from the RCMP uh, could decide to, uh, to reject that contract or to terminate that contract, and that would be fine as long as there's at least two years' notice. When we were looking at this issue in the context of uh, Vancouver, uh, it looked very much as if what you'd need actually was three to four years' lead-in in order to establish... A, a metro police service uh, from the current situation. So whatever happened, uh, you'd have to have it, all the ducks in a row and quacking before you actually delivered two years' notice. Uh, there are a number of possibilities uh, for this uh, province. Um, the most tantalizing from my point of view, and it's the one that I've had a lot of direct experience with, is the single jurisdiction police service uh, where you have just simply one police service covering um, the whole of British Columbia, for example, regardless of munis municipalities um, and uh, rural and remote areas in the province. This one single service, uh, you find that in, for example, Queensland, and New South Wales, and so forth. Um, the, another model is to have a collection of regional uh, police services, and you, you could let your imaginations run riot with this, you know, where you'd actually draw the boundaries. Uh, this has never been uh, fully developed, so it's not clear uh, where these boundaries might 
might be um, might be drawn. But this is borrowing very much from what is the contemporary uh, policing model in England and Wales, uh, where the country is just divided up into into regions, oftentimes amalgamations of of previous uh, county constabularies. Um, and then the the third possibility, realistically is to have a single amalgamated police service for large metropolitan areas, uh, such as Metro Victoria or Metro Vancouver. Um, eventually, in fact, there's some discussion about it now, um, the, uh, the Fraser Valley area, so the Fra South Fraser area from 200th Street East right out to, uh, to Hope. Um, that's perfectly feasible. Also one for... Uh, the Okanagan, which is a rapidly growing uh, conurbation. Um, and then you leave a provincial police service of some form, feasibly the RCMP under contract, uh, to work the rural and remote areas uh, of the province. Uh, there is a significant different, uh, difference between rural policing and remote policing, as I'm sure Randy will tell you. Um, it, remote policing is especially uh, challenging. But that's a, a poli policing challenge that you find in, in Australian jurisdictions as well. Just swap snow for sand. That's all you have to do. Um, I just thought you might be interested in some recent organisational changes that have occurred. Um, the, uh, these are the best I can do for the minute. It doesn't look as if there's been much movement since, um, since the mid-90s, although there's a lot of chatter at the moment about amalgamations in the Metro Vancouver area, uh, for example, the, the North Shore. Um, there's also chatter about um, the municipality of Richmond amalgamating uh, its police service with Vancouver. There's, there are a forest of reports, um, literally, <laughs> which uh, are available to study if, if you have an interest in that. Um, and we actually have an expert here who uh, has been involved in a couple of these and uh, would, be, would be happy, I've no doubt, to, uh, to tell you where to go and look for this information. 1995 is the most recent one, and it was a quiet amalgamation. It was Abbotsford. Uh, the Matsqui Police Department and the Abbotsford RCMP Detachment were amalgamated. Uh, significantly, this occurred not because of any policing requirement, but simply because they decided to amalgamate the municipalities of Matsqui and Abbotsford. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is a recurring theme, that it's not so much the needs for effective policing, public safety, public security in an area, it's more a reorganization of an area politically that results in amalgamations of police services. This happened, as you can see, the next one, 1995, it happened in Ottawa Carlton. There's a regional police service there that was a product of an amalgamation of three uh, municipalities. They amalgamated again in 2001 to form the uh, Ottawa Police Service. This was a model that was actually followed in, in Montreal, where they went, I think it was down from 30 municipalities to 12 uh, and then down to a single police service. I'm not sure about those numbers, but something like that. And then uh, 1996, there's a, the creation of the Halifax Regional Police, um, amalgamation of Halifax Police Department, Dartmouth Police Department, and Bedford RCMP. I don't know if people are familiar with this, but these are the, these are the municipalities that surround the harbour. Um, Bedford uh, Basin goes way in quite a, quite a distance, and... There was an RCMP detachment that uh, looked after that particular community. Dartmouth uh, to the north of the harbour and Halifax City uh, to the south. So, again, this was a function of the creation of Halifax Regional Municipality. It had nothing necessarily to do with effective policing. Um, when the new police services created, a decision was made, rightly or wrongly, to continue the RCMP in the rural areas of the new Halifax Regional Municipality, and they are extremely <laughs> rural. 
I was asked to just briefly uh, identify some key terms. Uh, these will be on the exam. Um, it's important because a lot of the information comes from journalists, God bless them, and they invariably get these terms mixed up. Um, regionalization is a buzzword, very much like community was a buzz buzzword in the late 60s, early 70s. If you attached community in front of almost anything, uh, you'd be assured of funding. Uh, and that, that was most certainly the case with policing and corrections and a whole range of different areas. Pardon my cynicism. Um, I tend to be an iconoclast. I, I really respect nothing. Um, so regionalization is a term that can be used basically to uh, apply to two possibilities. One, the creation of a single police service in a particular area. Uh, if you go to Ontario, for example, you've got Holdham and Norfolk Regional Police Service. That's an amalgamation of, of uh, smaller towns and police services into one. Um, or it can refer to the sharing of services across a particular policing area. And I note with, uh, with some amusement that the, the last five years, this term regionalization has been fully embraced by the RCMP, um, <laughs> even though I don't think they're terribly keen on the idea of amalgamated police services for the large metro areas. Uh, I don't mind taking a brick on that one, but I'm, I'm pretty convinced that that is the case. Um, but they've recognized, obviously, as a number of other organizations, that regionalization is an extremely rational way of proceeding, especially if you want to share services in a cost-effective manner, services that are not necessarily um, in demand 24-7. Uh, All right, so that's regionalization. It, it depends who you're talking to. But these are the two primarily, primary um, reasons or uh, explanations for uh, regionalization. Single police service or services shared across a policing area. The second term to watch out for is amalgamation. You'll see this is attached to municipalities, to the amalgamation of, of municipalities, bringing existing municipalities together into a new uh, municipality. It casts fear into the heart of uh, most municipal politicians and a lot of other individuals who, who stand to benefit from the status quo in a particular city. Um, so it, in many ways it's a dirty word, but it, 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 in terms of policing services it makes a heck of a lot of sense, especially in Metro Vancouver where amalgamation is, is clearly long overdue. And it just simply means combining existing services into one new service. And there are arguments for and against that. Uh, I think, on balance, the arguments in favor of it uh, push aside those against. One of the biggest ones th this day and age is how much is it going to cost. An amalgamation, I think, generally is shown to be uh, very cost-effective. Certainly not costing any more. You're more likely to get a more efficient police service if you amalgamate. The jury is out on that. Integration is the third term. This is a term much loved by the province of British Columbia. Uh, Any time an issue comes up around uh, policing in Metro Vancouver, or I'm not so sure about Metro Victoria, but certainly Metro Vancouver, uh, the answer to all the problems of cross-jurisdictional dialogue and cross-jurisdictional act activity is just create an integrated unit. Um, and that just simply means assigning individuals or units uh, from across several police services into one combined unit. And it's, um, it's something that was first raised in the original Opal report all those years ago, where he talked about policing in communities. Um, this is the big uh, three-volume monster that he, that he turned out. Uh, it was deemed to be uh, politically very valuable at the time because nobody wanted to confront the notion of actually amalgamating police services. So it was warmly embraced by successive attorneys general and, and solicitors general and politicians of all stripe and ilk. What I find interesting, this is my final comment, is that when you talk to the individuals who were attorneys general or solicitors general, uh, after they've left office, they invariably say, uh, that was a mistake, we should not have done that, we should have uh, gone directly and bit the bullet and gone for amalgamation. 
So those are my opening comments. Has anyone got any, any questions uh, about anything that I've just presented to you? Somewhat hurriedly, but yes, sir. Just a quick uh, clarification. You finished three or four years, so we have time for... Uh, yes, best estimate, yeah. I mean, you could do it in a hurry, but if you want it to be done properly, three to four years. I, 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 in terms of administration, in terms of what? Just about everything. All right, so you take, you, you take an existing uh, situation and you, you, you have to start somewhere. The strategy is to figure out you know, strategically how to introduce the changes, remembering that you've also got to deliver an effective service while you're creating significant turmoil uh, in an existing uh, police service. So it's, apart from anything else, it's the goodwill of the troops on the ground that uh, has to be very carefully managed. Did I answer your question? Okay, yes. Um, has amalgamation of police forces ever caused an increase uh, on the, the tax burden, on the, an increase in the budget? Or anything All right, let me just say this. Um, one, there's always startup costs, okay? And there was a startup cost figure for Metro Vancouver, which was several million dollars. Jamie would, would know what it actually is. Um, once you get going, um, again, you know, the, the difficulty here is figuring out how you separate out the changes that are occurring in a metropolitan area without amalgamations taking place and those that occur as a result of the amalgamation. So it's very difficult to come up with a, a, a figure. Um, the indications are that it certainly doesn't cost you any more, and you may actually get a, a more efficient police service. Depends on how you measure it, and it depends on whether you've got an accurate baseline uh, from which to work. One of the most astonishing things about uh, policing in BC is that there is no accurate baseline. Someone somewhere knows how much it costs, but it's not a public figure. It should be, but it's not a public figure. So there are startup fees, but it doesn't oh, yeah. cost more. Once you get going, it doesn't necessarily cost more. Another one? I appreciate this criminal justice forum, but one question that I keep coming to mind is um, everybody talks about either regionalizing or amalgamating police services. Why do I never read about uh, amalgamating solid waste management, roads, parks and recreation? We have just as many either professional or volunteer fire departments as police departments in the capital region of the yeah. but you never get headlines. What is it about policing service that draws uh, the attention of both the media and the public? I covered that. <laughs> you got it? I covered that question. Okay. Also, I mean, it's, it's. I know you asked me to ask that question, but I guess. I'll <laughs> <laughs> I know you. It's. I mean, it's. I mean, it, it's a sexy topic. It appeals to people more than parks and recreation, but you're right. And what happens the in? The key is to save money. What makes a policing dollar worth enough to study, but other services that municipalities offer not worth the time and effort? Well, it, it's the size of the size of the dollar. It's huge. Are you a property taxpayer in Victoria? Oh yeah. Okay, so do you, do you look at your your breakdown on an annual basis when you pay your property taxes? I certainly do. But having said that, your property tax isn't based upon the level of police service you get. Your property tax is based upon the value of your home. The level of service that you get if you have a $10 million home in one municipality may not be the same level of service you're getting with a, a, a comparable home in a different municipality. Yeah. So I, I don't know that that's a fair deal. Well, it, yeah, we, we could debate that, but okay. Uh, yes, well, just one more and then and we'll move on. Is it a mission of dollar and cent issue or is it a public safety issue? <laughs> you, you hit the nail on the head. It, it's both. When you talk to decision makers and uh, 
politicians about how you're going to uh, move ahead with this uh, because it's a public safety issue, the first thing you get back is, yeah, but it's going to cost a lot. And they don't, they don't want to expend the money on policing. You know, just look at the, the current provincial election. How much dialogue is there around policing amongst the candidates in this election? Exactly, none. And there wasn't in the last election, and there wasn't in the election before. It's a municipal issue, that's what they say. Yeah, but it isn't, is it? <laughs> the responsibility lies with the province. There's no doubt about that. All right, I'm going to shut up. Um, Jamie, you want to have? Okay. We've got to get him fired up here. So, okay, thank you. His, so we want to exit this, right? Okay, so we want to go out. Um, uh, Please look in. That's it. Oh. Uh, let's, let's, play, let's get it into the slide. Maybe if it's slide. Good, thanks very much. I'll, uh, uh, what are the rules, Rob? 15 minutes? Uh, yep. Perhaps? Okay, yep. so we'll, we'll try and get through this. I'm going to speak uh, fairly quickly, so there uh, will be times hopefully for some questions at the end. Um, first off, the, the point I really want to make here is there's no animosity between the, the players that are on the, uh, uh, the <laughs> dais. <laughs> So uh, we've been need, need, uh, known each other for years, and when I first uh, came here, I, all the, the four municipal chiefs are all friends of mine, have been so for many years. Paul and I have known each other for many, many years. So for, to me, this is just business. Uh, there's no animosity. And as we talk about individual police departments, including the Mounties, they are all quality police officers. There's, this isn't an issue of the quality of the product. This is organizational structure, okay? So... Uh, we are served in Canada, and I won't get into that, by the, some of the finest police departments uh, and individually uh, officers in the world. And they come from all over the world to study the way we do business. So uh, we'll just uh, pass that on. Um, first off, the, um, when we talk about regionalization, I make no bones about it. I'm a proponent of regionalization. It does not mean the Victoria Police is taking over. I will lose my organization and its history just like everyone else. What it means is an amalgamated service. Uh, I put forward a plan that I will, I will completely close down the Victoria Police Department, give it all to Paul. I'll give it all to Central Saanich. You police the region. I don't care what it's called. It could be called the Capital City Regional Police Department, the Saanich Victoria Police Department. We don't care. So it's not about turf. It's not about our history. And I, it would be as painful as, as me also. At one time, the Victoria Police, founded in 1858, we policed the whole island uh, at one time. So but it's important to understand this is about a structure, OK? We have 120, we have 100 and well, 1858, we were formed 126 years. Um, so we don't want to be pitted against each other, but uh, I think it's absolutely crucial to sort of talk about the main issues. Um, the boundaries that we work on right now were founded, I think, uh, set between 1846, 1912, and they bear no responsibility or no comparison to the way it looks now. It does not look the way it does right now, okay? Um, and the bigger issues for me is the, the, the patchwork quilt of municipalities that, that serve the Southern Peninsula here. That's four municipal departments, uh, three, three RCMP detachments. No one's in charge. There's no one unified command structure. Um, uh, that, what that means is when we cooperate and we work on issues together, there is no one structure. We work on a number of regional units together, uh, integrated units, but it's a blended operation. Uh, like I won't talk about it. We have a, Integrated Ursu, uh, integrated traffic unit that serves us between the ferry terminals, halfway up to Malahat, all the highways. There's one person in charge of the unit, but the person reports to a blended board of managers. And I'll, I can tell you that is no way to run an or a police organization. 
Okay? You need one boss, you need one person to make decisions. If that one person isn't doing the job, the municipality fires them. So if I don't do my job, I'm fired by my police board and my municipality. Okay? Um, so regionalization works. To suggest it wouldn't work in the southern peninsula means that every other major metropolitan area in Canada got it wrong. Okay? That means Winnipeg got it wrong, Toronto, Halifax, um, Edmonton, when they absorbed Jasper Place, the, what, you, what you see in Calgary right now, uh, Vancouver, and to a smaller degree here, we're the last remnants of this patchwork quilt, quilt of municipality. We're, la we're last. Uh, it's going to happen. It's just a question of when and how much pain we're going to go through. Uh, the smart money would suggest that if you're going to be regionalized or it's going to require a provincial government to ramrod this through, because you will not get consensus from elected municipal mayors. You will not. Each mayor's got their own particular views, and they do not agree on this particular issue. So the province, hopefully their first year of a mandate, when unpopular decisions have to get made, if they're going to make a decision, we don't say do it, we don't say regionalize instantly, but study the issue. And no one's ever studied the issue. And we, we, we now have a commitment fr from the existing government that they will study it as part of some recommendations. We'll see what happens. Um, oh, Bob, I didn't see you there. Good. Uh, um, <coughs> I, uh, just some background, I've worked in quasi-regional units. I worked in the North Vancouver with the blended municipalities there. I, uh, we'll see what the future holds there. I'm not sure how that's going to go. You know, the North Shore, three, two RCMP detachments and a city police department. Doesn't make much sense, okay? Um, so uh, I just want to make sure I cover the, the issues. Uh, um, I won't get into operational issues, but there are hundreds of them. We get almost daily cases where if we were a regionalized force, we, we could have caught the bad guy quicker, could have been, it could have been better, could have been smoother. Never do you say, you know, if we would have, uh, when we work on an operation, gee, if we were a split force, we probably would have solved this quicker. You just don't hear that, okay? Um, the, if you just look at a blended operation for the Southern Peninsula, including the RCMP jurisdictions, you're looking at probably 500 officers, okay? Uh, our budget alone is about 53 million, so you're probably looking at a $150 million budget. Once there, there's a critical mass in policing, once you get to that 400, 500, you begin to develop your own specialty units that are absolutely crucial, things that we cannot do here. Internet child cybercrime, uh, child pornography investigations that require such fall, we cannot do it because we simply don't have the numbers. We have to rely on the RCMP nationally or, uh, or Vancouver. Okay, the, um, um, we compete with one another. Um, we hire good people. Uh, I can tell you, as soon as I get wind, if, if I was to get wind, that Paul's about to hire a quality candidate, I'm gonna swoop in and I'm gonna hire him under, underneath. And that's the way it operates. We, are, we compete against one another. Now, uh, the, 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 the smaller rural, quasi-rural forces attract a different kind of officer. It doesn't mean it's, it's, it's worse or better, it's just different. Uh, and it doesn't mean rural policing is easier than big city urban policing and the rough and tumble of the down, downtown core. It isn't. I work in many rural areas. Many times you're alone and it's a real issue for us. But, uh, but we compete one another at recruiting. And I know for a fact that, and we've had to streamline our recruiting operations so that when we find somebody that's good, we hire them quickly. And we have systems to get in place. And if, through no fault of the RCMP, their system is, requires certain additional security measures and it's slow. And they lose lots of good candidates to agencies like mine. And I, and I flogged that for all it's worth when I was in Vancouver, and we're doing the same here now. And I have many kids that work for me right now that, uh, that had a number of applications, and one of them was with the RCMP. We just operate faster. So it, it doesn't make much sense, this kind of competition. It certainly doesn't. Okay, um, individual units. Uh, integrated units I am not a fan of. Uh, we've withdrawn from a couple of integrated units, and it'll be a rare case indeed where we get back into them. They simply do not work for an agency like ours. So if you look at individual units, here's an example. I have four police dogs in the city of Van uh, Victoria. The Sandwich Police Department has four dogs. The Mounties in the Southern Peninsula have two, two dogs, I think. All individual shifts, all different. We support one another quite a bit, but individual, own, individual commanders. And when we say, we've said to the agencies, why don't we put all the dogs in one spot in Central Sanders, place them all together? No, won't work. We, uh, to, uh, to what we're told is, well, we train our dogs differently. I mean, what horse, uh, I mean, what, it just does not make sense. I didn't. 
identification, forensic identification services. I've got uh, how many? Five? How many? I uh, Brian, about five. The RCMP have got five. I don't know how many Sanich has. I mean, they compete against one another. Uh, we, I found out the other day that we bought a $60,000 laser that's required for ident purposes. Just in conversation, Sanich bought one. And they, they, they're only used a small amount of time. So think of the expenses and the duplication. Think of the duplication and payroll, um, planning, uh, emergency planning, uh, ident, dogs, traffic sections, all these units. So we're in the process right now of finalizing an agreement with the municipality of Esquimalt. We, we got off the rails for about six months there. We're back on the rails. We, we're optimistic. This is going to uh, this is gonna get done pretty soon. But we police two municipalities. And there was a, a we, I mean, I, I'm fairly certain that when Nesquimo came on board in 2002, there were assurances given at the time by the provincial government that they would be the first department in terms of a regional force. And you know, once they regionalized with us, uh, for some reason, the, the, the political will wasn't there to continue. And it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating relationship, but, uh, but it's, uh, it can get difficult at times, but it's working, okay? Um, when we talked about dogs, and Rob talked about it a bit, okay, four dogs with us, four dogs with uh, Saanich, two with the Mounties. Suppose we put them all together on one commander. Maybe we don't need 10 dogs, okay? Dogs, a dog and a dog handler is probably 200,000 bucks, I think, by the time you, the wages and the training of the dog, you know. So there's savings to be had. Uh, we have about 75 individual plainclothes officers between the whole Southern Peninsula that are doing surveillance, that are doing what we call target teams. Uh, we call them strike force, but we call them different issues. Uh, sometimes working on the same targets, okay? Uh, it doesn't make much sense. I firmly believe that a 400 person, a police force, 500, doesn't need that many officers. So there's shavings. We also, um, I have a very small group that I've sort of tasked with trying to put the meat on the bones of regionalization. We talk about it, but we only talk about it in academic terms. We, we say regionalization would work, maybe it will work, well, maybe it won't. So I've gone to a small group, constables and two sergeants, to say, okay, if you had a regional force, show me what it would look like. And in about three days, they came back to me with a rough sketch, threw a map on the wall of my office and say, here, here, we'll, we'll, we'll cut the lower district into four, four districts, like Vancouver does, four districts for the city. Four districts, we'll draw a line right across McKenzie. Those areas of Oak Bay and Saanich that are residential will be a district. Downtown Core will be a district. West Shore is a district. And the rural areas of North, North uh, Saanich and Sydney have a rural district. Okay? Put a commander in each zone, precinct in the existing buildings. There's no capital expansion, no more uh, infrastructure. You save the salaries of four police chiefs. Okay? So I think there's a lot of savings. I think there is. And uh, so anyway, I, 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 I want to answer your questions, and, I, and it's absolutely crucial that please you understand that this isn't, there's no slight against the officers that we work with. We work extremely well together. Lepard put it really well. Doug Lepard, uh, he's the deputy chief in Vancouver, and his office is on Gravely Street, which is right on the border by Boundary Road. And he is briefed every day, as I am, by my people as to what's happened overnight, what, do you got, what did you do yesterday, what do you got planned tomorrow, and what were the crimes overnight. He looks out of his office at Boundary Road and he looks into Burnaby. He hasn't got the faintest idea what's happening across the street. I mean, absolutely ridiculous, unless he reads it in the newspaper. He just does not know. On major cases, there might be a liaison between the individual units, but all operating on, in silos on their own. Now, I, I, I'm no longer an expert in Vancouver. I think a regional force would work there. there they've got other issues at the plate. And the last thing I would leave you with is that if you don't think that I'm right, uh, and I'm sure these officers will have compelling arguments. Let's look at individual studies done by academics, done by just, uh, former Justice Opal, done by the coroner's inquest at the Lee murder homicide, all recommended we do this. Uh, uh, Wally Opal heard over a period of six months, heard 100, 150 witnesses on one of the most brutal crimes in Canadian history, uh, an, an academic uh, study with, that actually listened to what people have to say, uh, people that are affected, and one of his strongest recommendations is that we pursue regionalization. It wasn't my idea, he, he, he came to the table. He made the same recommendations in 1995 in his landmark case on, on, on policing in British Columbia. The Lee murder homicide, a complicated case, a devastating case with three jurisdictions involved. Uh, who knows what would have happened, but the, the coroner's inquest at the time certainly made recommendations about regionalization. So I'm going to let my colleagues talk. I've got I've got lots of material, but I want to. I think that if you're you're given 15 minutes, you get 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks.
and I didn't even go through my slides. Everything I said <laughs> is in the slides. <laughs> you hate slides anyway, I know. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so after listening to Jamie and to our moderator, I, I've been convinced that this is, this is the answer. So my, my presentation probably won't make a lot of sense. But anyway, I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here this evening and to uh, provide you with some comments in the next 10 to 15 minutes. And during that, my comments, I want to highlight three considerations and perhaps have you look at a slightly different perspective than what you've heard. And Hopefully that will lead to a little bit of discussion later in the, in the evening. And I also want to make it very clear that I don't believe there exists a simple solution to the future of policing in this region or any region in the world. Amalgamation is, is a complex issue. Before moving to my points, we all know that amalgamation is complex, one that we continually want to simplify. I think it's just human nature that we want to make complex issues into simplistic ones. So the three considerations. And we, some of this will be a little bit of repetition in relation to some of the other comments, but I'll go through it anyway. Who decides the decision-making power for policing in BC? The, the BC Police Act makes it clear that the authority for providing policing is on local governments. Municipalities get to choose if they want to have a municipal department of their own or they want to contract with the provincial police in the province in, in, with a municipal contract. Right now in BC, I believe there's 12 municipal police services and several RCMP units throughout the province. The province you heard establishes the standards, so they control the, uh, the nature of policing. It's up to the local municipalities to ensure those standards are met. Police integration and amalgamation. Amalgamation has been talked about in this area for more than 50 years. In the fall of 2000, the mayors and police chiefs in the five greater municipalities came together to review the service delivery and began the process of integrating specialized police services. They endorsed integration as a model of a choice. And I agree with the moderator that the provincial government has really been mute on this point. They've always said that they will help support policing if the municipalities come to them. They're not about to impose anything upon the municipality. In December 2000, working committees were established to look at police services within, with the exception of local patrol. In 2003, the Solicitor General of the day, Rich Coleman, actually through order and council formed a committee to look at specialized policing services, regionalization and amalgamation in the greater Victoria area. <coughs> They, they were um, uh, instructed to come back with a plan and deliver it in, I believe it was November of 2003. And again, those meetings did not prove to be fruitful. Um, I sat on those committees back then, and uh, there was always very different perspectives being presented. <coughs> when you look at integration, you have to understand that uh, it is one model. We talk about amalgamation, we talk about regionalization. It is really a spectrum of opportunities for us. At one end, amalgamation is generally, understood, is generally understood would place all of the CRD policing services, the municipal services, and the RCMP under one umbrella. Most believe under the Victoria umbrella. Uh, so there is some concerns from the outside areas about loss of service, loss of, uh, loss of control. At the under, other end of the spectrum would be complete local autonomy. Regionalization and integration are found between the two ends of that spectrum. Integration maintains lo local police entities such as patrol but harmonizes the special, specialized functions that some that you've heard about. I'm going to spend a few moments in the presentation in, in a few minutes just to talk a little bit about some of the work I did back in 2000 when I was writing a thesis in relation to policing on the Sandwich Peninsula. Working together 
and promoting a unified fr uh, front against crime is a no-brainer. We all agree with that. The rising cost of policing has have influenced some to believe that amalgamation would reduce costs. The, the research that I've looked at does not support this. The cost of delivery is a very important consideration when we're looking at municipal budgets, city budgets across the region. In central Sanders, we work very closely with the RCMP, our neighbor to the north. We operate on the same radio frequency and now often back each other up on calls. Individual frontline officers do not see borders or boundaries. Members continually back each other up regardless of the jurisdiction. We have been very active in youth education programs on the peninsula. The picture here was taken recently at a First Nations training day put on by the RCMP and the Central Sounds Peace Service. We contract with the RCMP to provide both dispatch and 911 services, as well as forensic identification services. Our police service being a small one on the peninsula is treated much like a company. We look for the services that we can't design and, and deliver on our own and look for ways to making good arrangements with our neighbors. <coughs> Here are some examples of provincial Van uh, Vancouver Island and regional integration initiatives that have occurred over the, the last 13 years. The first four really talk about provincial initiatives. BC Prime is the first integrated data system in North America. It's real-time sharing of information regardless of location. Vancouver Island Major Crime Unit, which is fairly new in the last few years, is made up of municipal and RCMP members throughout the island. Their focus is on homicides and serious crime. The last bullets here really talk about more regional in the Victoria area of, of units that have been designed over the last well, in the last 13 years. Uh, speak briefly about the Crest Radio System, which was created to allow more than 40 emergency services to contact, connect to each other on one system. Previously, there was more than 30 systems operating. This goes back to 2001, uh, when it was thought about. 2003, it became operational. Uh, just a, a matter of interest, they receive approximately, the Crest Radio uh, System receives approximately 8 million calls annually. In thinking about success, we also must continue to evaluate and ensure there is value for those who participate. I looked at recent news articles this week as I prepared to come here this evening and used the uh, Combined Forces Special Enforcement Unit as just one example of an integrated provincial unit in this province that seems to be working really well. It has had great success, something that we really should be proud of. Some of the headlines in the newspaper, if you look. So the Combined Force Special Enforcement Unit has been extremely effective as, as exemplified in these headings. <coughs> Money and property from crime is benefiting communities. Agencies are working together to make BC a safer place. The money and assets of criminals, the proceeds of those crimes, are being returned to communities to enhance police services. This Hummer in this picture is just one example. The vehicle was, it was seized from a drug trafficker and now is being used to put the message out in different communities. Here's a recent headline in March uh, from the uh, National Post, March 2013. And it, you know, we've heard that we are one of the, of the last unamalgamated cities in Canada. Here's a couple quotes that I took from that article. So we, just to show you that the experts disagree. Thoughtful, intelligent changes must be based on evidence. What problems are we trying to solve? What makes amalgamation or regionalization the right or the best solution to the problem? What actually is the problem? Bish, who's a local known to many of us here, studied multiple examples of amalgamation and found only one to be successful in his opinion, and that was the abbotsford Matsqui amalgamation in 1995. In 1999, I interviewed the chief of Abbotsford, uh, Barry Daniels, who was the chief of Matsqui at the time of the amalgamation, and asked him about the results of that amalgamation. He believed that it was far more efficient and a cost-effective service once they amalgamated. I believe our moderator tonight also believes that the, the pooling of resources creates efficiencies. I also spoke to the executive of the Ottawa City Police back in 1999, talked to them about their amalgamation. 
They, t they told me that that also resulted in more efficient police services, less confusion, and duplication. Torontonians have hated their municipal amalgamation. And within the article that I showed you, if they could go back, they would. But they're afraid of the cost of returning to what was, one, was once, uh, according to the mayor, Rob Ford. Chatham-Kent in Ontario is another municipal amalgamation. One thing that's common about the amalgamations that I looked at, they all uh, were really uh, founded within the municipal amalgamations. The police just came afterwards. <coughs> so in, in 2000, I did a, um, a master's thesis on policing on the peninsula, uh, Senate's Peninsula. During the research, I interviewed individuals from around the community, which included municipal police officers, RCMP officers, politicians, and members of the public. The most important aspect was service delivery. Citizens did not want to see a reduction in their police services. They were not afraid to pay a little bit more, but they did not want to see a reduction. Political leaders were loyal to the respective police organizations. Although an interest in coming together, no one was prepared to move forward on the idea of a regional amalgamated or joint police service on the peninsula. Mistrust was apparent, particularly with the political leaders of the day. My responsibility has always been to members of the public. I believe we need to continually examine our service delivery and do what is best for the people that we serve. We need to be careful in what we do and not make changes that are not well thought out and researched. It is also believed by many that amalgamation would deplete resources from the outside areas to the core of Victoria, also eliminating local governance and increasing <coughs> local costs. I think it's important to, to follow what's happened in Esquimalt, and hopefully we can learn from that experience. <coughs> the horrific events of Picton and Lee have highlighted the concerns of police fragmentation and mistakes made during these investigations. Some would suggest that a regional force or amalgamated force would not have prevented these tragedies. It's a quote uh, from Leonard Krogh at the time. It's important that we continue to work together. I believe we have made tremendous progress over the last 13 years, but also know that our work will, ne will never be finished. There's much yet to be done. It is necessary to continue with a process that honors organizational, community, and individual values. The police, community, and political leaders will work better when there's mutual respect, concern, and honesty, regardless of our differences. I want to thank you again for letting me be here tonight, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts. And remember that amalgamation is a complex issue. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I've gotten in the habit when I have the opportunity to, to speak at, uh, at uh, public forums to uh, acknowledge something. In this case, I'd like to acknowledge that we're enjoying this forum in the uh, traditional territories of the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations. Um, in my time in those communities uh, with First Nations, uh, I was often, uh, from the elders, uh, directed or suggested to speak from the heart. So I don't have a prepared uh, presentation. Right? I'm just going to tell my story as it relates to um, interagency policing, integrated policing, amalgamated policing. And I'm going to throw another term in there that didn't show up there, something called joint force operations. So I started my uh, policing career as a municipal cop in lower mainland, also uh, police provincial areas, I spent time on a federal enforcement unit, and spent time on an independent municipal agency of Vancouver Police Department, walking the beat on Granville Street. So I've spanned the spectrum just in that, in that locale and consistently agency to agency, individual street cop to street cop, the existence of the color of the uniform or the, or the design on the shoulder flash, 
and it's already, uh, you're going to hear some of the things I say are a bit repetitive, as what my colleagues have already said, and which in fact has been mentioned out front. It meant nothing. You all were dedicated, committed, catching the bad guys, work together, back each other up, uh, take care of policing business without any consideration. In fact, the, uh, the, the oversight, the management, for the most part, you tried to keep it out of your mind so you could effectively uh, perform your job on the street. So never did I encounter any conflicts in that where there was challenges with territorial approaches like, let's get the job done, let's work together. In fact, we liked going into the other guy's territory because when we caused us a, a bit of trouble there, we just went back to our own and they had to, they were left with it. So, Next opportunity to look or to, to see interagency policing, I spent some time with our audit branch as a review principal in our headquarters in Ottawa and one of the several audits that they had to do was of joint force operations nationally uh, for the, uh, the RCMP. So what that was looking at and joint forces, uh, joint force operations defined as uh, an emergency response where units came together to uh, deal with an issue, for example, a, a large plane crash on the East Coast, forest fires uh, in another part of the country <coughs> where there's an immediate response forces came together uh, to deal with that. Other short-term joint force type operations occurred for special events, sporting events, uh, extraordinary or complex investigations, multi-jurisdiction investigations for the sole purpose of that investigation, G8 summits, those kinds of things, once again, short-term joint force operation. Then there were some longer-term specific projects, so again, a complex investigation might go on for two or three years where the joint forces were brought together, established, and then disbanded at the end of that. And then uh, as well, a long-term permanently established uh, joint force, such as in the day there was uh, coordinate, or the, uh, the clue unit in Lower Main Lab, there was the, uh, the Vancouver Integrated Intelligence Unit, and there was a weapons, uh, National Weapons Unit in the uh, Greater Toronto Region, and today we have we saw it up there, the Combined Forces Special Enforcement Unit, permanently established, uh, blended, uh, integrated, blended, amalgamated units. Again, consistently in that review across Canada, looking at all those models on that spectrum, cops on the street, in fact, when I, when I looked at the, uh, the integrated unit in the Greater Cornwall region, some folks weren't sure what agency the guy across the desk from them worked with. They it, it literally took the shoulder flash off at the door. They were there all for the same reason, all committed, all dedicated, all brought their skills. And as Jamie mentioned, across Canada, that's what you'll find on the cops on the street. They get business done. At the next level, and I, I'm talking supervisors and, and uh, basically investigators, and they're overseen for the most part by some sort of a joint management team. And it could have been as high as the chief within those departments or some operations officer that would come together uh, and at that level perhaps there would be some types of, of uh, I wouldn't say conflict but uh, a clash perhaps of home agency policies, bureaucracy, a union environment versus a non-union environment and however at that level those folks resolve those issues. Again that level of cooperation we talked about and, and at the, at the managers of the organization no issues, again, uh, challenges, work together, overcome them so that other component can get the job done. Where there was some challenges or some, I guess, not necessarily conflict, but barriers to being successful occur at the next level. So the level of governance, if you will, that oversees those police agencies where there may have been disagreements. Of course, that's out of the hand, that's out of the control of uh, those managers to some degree as much as they negotiate uh, chat but when you have several masters they don't always see eye to eye and preferably or hopefully those that joint uh, management team precluded that from getting down and impacting policing for the most part generally successful. Next phase of my career go to the southeast district of the RCP based out of Kelowna and during my time there as operations officer we in fact amalgamated, if you will, uh, police agencies. Mind you, they were all RCMP agencies, but they police several different municipalities in what we now know as the Vernon North Okanagan Detachment, 
Penticton, South Okanagan detachment, which covers several uh, municipal uh, detachments there, as well as the provincial component, of course, and uh, the Kootenai Boundary Region. So we have a, a single chief of police, if you will, overseeing those um, uh, amalgamated uh, models. And moving to my time over in, uh, on the island here as the commander of the island district, we also have blended units, if you will, blended municipalities. Uh, there's five separate municipalities uh, overseen by the uh, officer in charge of the West Shore Detachment, plus the provincial component, plus the two First Nations. Uh, Sydney North Saanich, a blended unit. Duncan North Couch in a blended unit. Comox Valley, a blended unit with several municipalities. So we are experiencing um, amalgamated police forces, mind you, all RCMP uh, combinations from what was before. The challenge is there. Uh, again, uh, the folks on the street, the, the fellas in West Shore, they don't know if their salary is paid for by the Highlands or by uh, View Royal or by Langford or Colwood. They just get the job done. But once you get to the level of management that you have to answer to, and understandably so, to those governors or those political masters, then you can get some diversion. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm thinking five separate municipalities, that's enough of a burden, plus, again, the provincial component. If you were to take that and have 13 separate mayors, 13 separate councils, 13 separate police boards, 13 separate budgets to answer to, uh, I'd hate to be that chief of police or that, that officer in charge. Because, you know, it could be red, could be blue, depending on how it goes. Uh, so I'll use that terminology. But it would be a huge challenge. And you can imagine, because you have to answer and have your discussions in chats at council meetings, do that 13 times. You know, you, you're taken away from your activities and overseeing police operations and working with your people. And, and it's, it's, so it's quite, it would be quite a, uh, a challenge. As I looked at some of the uh, references to currently existing amalgamated police units across Ontario, and, and there are some in Nova Scotia as well. Uh, in my time in Ottawa Branch, I did do some traveling and looking at other models, models of district policing, and had uh, chats with those folks here. And consistently, what I see is before those police agencies amalgamated, the municipalities amalgamated into a single municipality, a single governing body. So naturally, the police agency just rolled up under that. And in fact, naturally, all other services, as was mentioned here, there was some concern, whether it's parks, whether it's uh, public works, fire, they will all naturally roll up under that, that single governance. So that might be the first step to go down that road before you, you create uh, such a complicated model, a uh, challenging model for, uh, for, uh, for chief of police. Um, there was a, a couple of comments, and I'll just sort of draw from that. The one question about, um, is it better before or after amalgamation? And I talked to my colleague, uh, Assistant Commissioner Lipinski, who's my equivalent in the Lower Mainland, a little, little bigger piece of the pie there, but similar discussions. And so before he had a forum like this, he took the opportunity or tried to find, is there anywhere in those models that we saw there a before and after assessment? Before the amalgamation, what, as, as was mentioned here, was a baseline, either cost efficiencies or operational efficiencies. Now you have that, and after the amalgamation, has anyone actually looked at them and said, yes, there was a benefit to it, or not? None, none have been done that we're aware of. Maybe it's something for academia to, uh, to look at. Another question on, um, on what's more important, you know, funding or budgets or public safety? And it lets me lead into a little mantra that I, I, every time I, I get a chance to get into communities and I, and I do run up and down the island in our already existing amalgamated 900 strong police force on Vancouver Island here and chat with the elected officials about why is it that um, during the, the politicking that public safety never hits the agenda, never hits the, hits the platform. And of course, when it comes to funding, we are competing, uh, policing or public safety, with uh, education, with healthcare, which seem to hit it. And I have an answer for that. Because if you're to go out and talk to folks in the community, and it doesn't matter where in policing, there's a very high level of satisfaction with policing, high level of trust, high level of respect for policing. So if you're politically motivated, say, what do you think about policing? We are so happy with policing. Thank you. That's no longer an issue. Let me focus on the important issues that need some attention. So in a way, we're our own worst enemies. And I say that because what I just described as, 
as the success or the, or the level of, uh, of trust and respect in policing, it occurs on the backs of our members, boys and girls on the street doing the job, and they will not allow their policing or their community to fail. They will not give up the reputation of their organization. They will not give up their commitment. But it comes at a price. It comes at a price of the burden on those individuals. But you know what? That's why uh, public safety doesn't hit the radar because we're taking care of business, my opinion. I'm, and I'm going to throw a little bit of fodder in here for this. So I know you're from different areas, uh, and really the focus on the amalgamated policing concept is municipal policing. But uh, as uh, Rob said here, there, there is a provincial component. So in your spinning of the discussion and whatever uh, forums you may leave here from and have a chat about, is maybe we should also be considering what would it look like to blend or amalgamate the existing isolated provincial components and is there efficiencies to be gained through that? Maybe have five or six super provincial detachments spread out through looking after the entire provincial area outside those municipal areas or wherever that municipal agency ends up with the boundaries. Just something to think about if the, if the same rationale or logic applies to economies of scale and I'll, I'll just finish up by saying uh, in those, when we went down the road of those amalgamated units in the Okanagan I went forward in the discussion or debate, in fact, because some of them we didn't necessarily want to go down that road of, three key considerations that must exist before we go down that road. And again, touched on a bit by my colleagues. Number one is an increased flexibility with human resource management. The larger pool of human resources you have, you can deal with absence from duty due to illness, training courses, Annual leave, smaller units, one or two people out makes a difference. Larger resources to draw upon. And as well, expertise skill level. Greater pool to train, develop, and as was already mentioned, into a, a special. So first consideration, will you have a, a, a gain in flexibility of human resources? Second thing, and I think was also touched on a bit, will there be a reduction of redundancies? Can you go from four or five or six or seven cell blocks and prisoner management systems to a single one? Can you go from several records management systems and exhibit management systems to a single one? Reducing those kinds of things and other examples of that. You reduce those redundancies. And the last thing or the third thing was um, tied to that, but is there a reduction in administrative activities for police personnel? For example, do you have several levels of management dealing with uh, equipment, uh, dealing with uh, reports, dealing with a variety of, that can be relieved of those duties by a single administrative system that puts more cops on the street doing their uh, supervision uh, or, or street police work. So all three of those existed. I would consider uh, you know, the, the amalgamation. The challenges that we did run into, just for, for your information as I finish here, was when we blended some of those detachments, some of the more remote aspects, more areas, added logistical challenges. How do you, or how long does it take for that member to leave that corner of the, of the uh, region and transfer that prisoner to the centralized location? And is he, how long is he away from being available for policing? Or if he has to take an exhibit, you know, practical stuff, logistic, and transfer that to a centralized repository. Does that take away from an efficiency by distance? So that did come up as much as we, we looked at reduction of redundancies and administration, there were some curves thrown at us. So that's, uh, that's it. That's Thank you, Randy. Thank you. Now we come now to uh, the general conversation and questions and discussions. Oh, you want to take a break? Coffee. Just to get your time. All right. Well, Take 10 minutes, but come back, please. <laughs> yeah. All right, the floor is, uh, is open. Yes, sir. Um, I was wondering about with the amalgamated services between Esquimalt and Victoria, how effective is the framework given the municipalities have two 
distinctly different needs with the downtown core and the public core in Esquimalt and how does how do you guys arrive at the framework for these and if this arrangement is working so well why did they seek other suitors such as the RCMP and how does this work for being a framework as you were quoted a week ago saying to woo other municipalities in you've got about five questions yeah. there. you've got a lot <laughs> yeah. yeah I um, do, you, do you want to refresh it yeah I could no, I, I'll give you just a general overview uh, uh, the decisions were made in O2 by the provincial government uh, just just remember that uh, the the amalgamation between us and Esquimalt was done for a very valid reason at the time with there was issues with their with the Esquimalt Police Department so um, uh, the amalgamation was done I mean, anyone that suggests that this is an easy arrangement, it's not. It's tricky. And uh, over time, uh, there were some issues that raised, and, uh, and consecutive mayors didn't have an issue. The mayor that's in office right now raised certain issues. As a result of those issues, we entered into renewed discussions about the framework. And the original framework simply meant all, every, for all the bills are divided 86%, Victoria, 14%, as well. Split, that's the way the... I spend a buck, that's the way it's divided. And Esquimalt was of the view that that's, uh, that's a lot. They pay over $6 million for policing. And for $6 million, their view was we could go and get an independent police force, get just as good. Uh, we have different views on that. The province did not agree, simply ordered them, you're gonna, you and Victoria are gonna make nice, you're gonna, ma you're gonna, you're gonna negotiate and make this happen. And we're in the middle of that right now, so I'm optimistic this is go going to get done. One of the options we've looked at is, I'm optimistic that if this gets done, it is the framework for other municipalities, should they decide that, look, let's be part of a regional force. We don't have to do this all over again. We just add an appendix to the cost sharing, whatever that formula is. But as Paul said, that, that puzzle, it is, it is complicated. I mean, I know people who, I'm not trying to center anybody in the room, who entered this with the view that this may be easier than it is. It's not, it's tricky and it's, you're dealing with emotions, you're dealing with the history of organizations and, and who may cease to exist. But if, if the, well, there's only one taxpayer, but if the taxpayer is important, I think this is, this is the future. And as I said, it's worked in other parts of Canada and it's, I mean, you can argue how great it is, but it's coming. The, the cost of policing, uh, I didn't mean to ramble, we consume 25% of the, of the municipal budget, between 20 and 25% is the police. And for that, municipal leaders have a say in what we do, and, and they are interested in what we do. We have a very active council in Victoria and Esquimalt, and we try and be as responsive as we can. So uh, no one said this was easy, but uh, we're, we're making it work. Sorry, I don't know if we've covered all your issues. So. All right. So. Uh, that's something in the uh, follow on question to that. Is your perceived desire to uh, see an amalgamated or regionalized police force within Victoria driven by something more like the political question that the costs of policing something like the downtown core and or Esquimalt are greater than the tax base of those two municipalities are capable of supporting? And perhaps uh, yeah. Chief Hames can also weigh in on that. Yeah, uh, yeah th that's, it's a tricky issue. Um, um, Victoria, Montreal, Vancouver all suffer from what's called the core city phenomenon. That means people come in here to work, they come in here to party at night, and, and the people where they come in from other municipalities do not contribute to that infrastructure. Now the argument is, hey, we get all the revenue from the bars and everything, so it kind of works out. Well, it doesn't work out. Now, we get along, and if we track the, number, the people we arrest, a lot of them aren't from Victoria. They're citizens from outside Victoria. So. The issue for us from a, from a cost perspective is the average, here's some numbers for you, the average income in Victoria is $38,000 a year, average. Uh, about, a, I think it's a third or a, or a quarter of the population is 18,000 bucks and less. So we're not a rich municipality. You go to Saanich, the average is $75,000. They are a wealthy suburb without a downtown core and they benefit from, they have a budget issue where they are able to have certain officers doing certain jobs. So we think that with a regional force, uh, through GPS technology, they won't, they won't lose police officers. If their municipality wants to have five officers patrolling all the time in Saanich, they can have that. But what they will lose is their administrative infrastructure. They would lose that. But, but if we were a regional force, we would have to find places for an amalgamated dog unit, amalgamated traffic unit, amalgamated uh, forensic ident, and that would probably be in a central location, would probably be in the Saanich area. So, there's, 
But the, the, core, the core city issue is a major one. Um, and I often point out, particularly in the debate in Metro Vancouver, is that there really is no longer a single core city. If you look at the spread of, of Vancouver, it actually has about three, uh, each of which pulls people in for work and recreation. Um, uh, often not as large as the situation in downtown Vancouver, but it's still uh, a very significant chunk uh, of the population are moving into those outside uh, metropolitan areas or sub areas in the city. So to just simply view uh, Vancouver, for example, as a place that has a core city to which all resources would be drained, I think is, is a falsehood. The other issue there is that oftentimes those uh, core city areas, plural, in a metro area, uh, are extremely good training grounds for uh, junior police officers who then gravitate as they uh, acquire families, who then gravitate to the outer areas. So you actually get uh, expertise moving out, not in to the inner city areas. So that benefits people in the suburban areas. I think that's often lost sight of. Uh, there was a study done on where ambulance, police and fire service personnel live in Vancouver and they're all living on the outer areas. No surprise. Jamie. Yeah, the, um, one of the areas that um, Randy had made is, wh why not look at, uh, if we're going to have a, r a regional force in the southern peninsula, why not make it all RCMP? I mean, let's, why not? Why not look at that? Well, the difficulty is the Mounties, through no fault of them, run about, about anywhere from 20 to 30 percent vacancies in many of their places. And we've done a, just a very rough calculation. Then the dedicated officers that work at West Shore are severely under under resourced. They need more cops there. But it, if a municipality can get away with paying a fewer number of officers, they do. You talk to people in West Shore how often they see police versus where they see other other areas. And it is not a slight on the Mounties. I spent 35 years with them. It's a it's a, one of the best organizations in the world. But but it's tough sledding. And and we we work under different environments. If I was to convince all the Mounties to come and join uh, the Victoria Police, I can't. They're, there's no pension portability, so they would give that up. So there's no there, and vice versa. So it's a that's one of the wrinkles to a blended a blended operation. Just uh, see whether our two colleagues want to. Uh, well, I was just going to add in relation to your comment that in I the see. area that I, uh, I, I I police, there's <coughs> probably more fear than a reality in relation to the fact that. If there wasn't an amalgamated police service, the resources and the services would go downtown because of the workload downtown. And the fear would be that the taxes locally would be going up to pay for that increase in service. And generally speaking, seven, I'm talking about 17,000 people approximately, they like the service they're receiving and they don't want to jeopardize it. Uh, so I think part of the question about the fear is if something was to change is to make sure that there would be strong leadership to ensure those sort of things did not happen so that the local service delivery would remain the same that people have come to be accustomed to meeting their own expectations. Brian, did you have a comment? Maybe just make two comments and one may seem a little bit exaggerated when I make the comparison but the discussion around um, criminals coming from somewhere else into our jurisdiction therefore like, share the pain of policing those criminals. So the exaggeration is um, Merritt Mountain Music Festival, which we were responsible for policing. Huge event, a big draw for the area, supported politically. Uh, but most of the criminal activity was from folks from, maybe it was the nature of a country in Western, but of Surrey, Langley, Fraser Valley. But we did not go to those municipalities and say, hey, buck up for the activities of your citizens in our at our event. Now, again, it's a long ways away, so it's maybe easier to make that statement versus the region here. But again, I guess my comment would be from a, from a political perspective, if you uh, generate the kind of interest or activity in your municipality that causes that influx, then plan and fund your policing accordingly. Uh, on the, uh, the hiring or the attrition rate, if you will, every police agency has an attrition rate where you uh, people retire, you're the replaced, one of the reasons there may be a delay sometimes in our process because we may go a long distance to uh, change from our uh, one policing activity to another. But 
how many police someone reports seeing on the street isn't necessarily a measure of anything. What you want to look at is the efficiency of that police force. Are they uh, solving crime? Are they uh, responding to calls? Are they dealing with uh, the criminal element in the community? And can you measure that statistically? What's the crime rate there? Is it, is it satisfactory being managed? That other discussion aside, we all have human resource challenges, of course. That's my comment. Okay. Let's hang on, the mic will get to you in a second. I just wanted to make a distinction between what the panelists have said and then read five sentences out of an article from the National Post. That's okay. okay. Um, so uh, Superintendent Wilson had commented during his time that they do have amalgamated forces uh, in different regions throughout the province. Um, and then distinctly, Chief Graham said that the RCMP services are generally slower. From this post and from this article in the National Post that came out in March of this year, of the five sentences, it, it goes over amalgamation and says, one of Canada's first forays into amalgamation was Winnipeg in 1972, an effort generally considered a noble failure by pretty much all observers and across the political spectrum, wrote Michael Dudley, senior research associate at the University of Winnipeg's Institute of Urban Studies in 2012. Torontonians hated amalgamation even before the province imposed it as a disastrously ill-advised cost-saving scheme in 1998. Fifteen years later, even the mayor, whose own father was part of the government that engineered amalgamation, isn't particularly crazy about the megacity. Quote, if it didn't cost us a dime, I think everybody would agree, let's go back. Unquote, Toronto Mayor Rob Ford told the Post in 2011. If, could, if you're going to read from the National Post, why don't you pick up the editorials from the Globe and Mail, the T TC, three other publications that take a contrary view? So I couldn't read all of them at the same time. I do have another article as well from a different publication. I'm hoping you can help me to understand something. I'm trying to take everything that I've heard here tonight and, and put it together. And what I'm hearing is that in other jurisdictions where police forces have amalgamated, that's happened with other municipal districts all amalgamating. And some of the challenges with that are that there's, for an easy way to say it, sort of winners and losers in the whole uh, economic, social differences, the comfort that they have with their current levels of service. And so what I'm seeing here is that if we're ever to have an amalgamation, there needs to be an impetus to get some uh, regional municipal amalgamation as, as one of the core parts of the overall process. So what was the impetus in these other situations to bring together the, the regional municipal amalgamation in the first place that then allowed policing to follow suit? Usually, usually the, the, the discussion that, that, that takes off on regional policing is a crisis. Usually something happens and it triggers uh, pressure, um, interest from the media, government intervention. Uh, we thought that that would happen with the Lee homicides in Victoria. We were sure it's going to happen as a result of the Opal Commission. You don't get those kinds of strong recommendations. And we're not saying do it, but at least study it. I mean, at least let's, let's do a formal study with professionals to come back and look at all the modeling and tell us what's, what's so. Now, Rob touched on it. Um, it would be dangerous for us, for me, to certainly wade into the, the regionalization of municipalities. That's another discussion for another day that your elected lead. We're talking about a blended, uh, a blended force that reports to multiple municipalities. And Randy said it would be a challenge reporting to 13 municipalities, but police chief does not report to municipalities they report to a police board. So the 13 municipalities would appoint through some uh, governing mechanism, oh, eight to 10 person board, and we would report to the board. That, the, uh, there, in, in Canada, there's a division between policing and elected leaders, and it's done for a valid reason. So, and the only thing I would add to, the, to our discussions is, is to have a careful look at the ambulance service in this province. Uh, you, you know, the, uh, the, the, the value of having one operation throughout the whole province with a, some, a series of smaller operations. And, and it, was, it was brought together for very valid reasons, and now it's a model of, across Canada. So it seems to work well. And the naysayers that say it won't work, well, it does work. 
you know, that's the, that's the sad reality. Can I just respond? There, there is a very close tie between prior amalgamation of municipalities and subsequent amalgamation of police services. But the two things, symbiotic. It's not necessary for the amalgamation of municipalities to occur before you can amalgamate police services. It just so happens it's flowed that way. And in fact, if you look at other large cities, New York, London, in England, wherever, you'll find that the amalgamations uh, have occurred, have been well established for years and years and years. Um, even though there's a patchwork quilt of municipalities lying underneath. Do you know it's the, just a funding issue. In, in England, uh, does anyone know the model that's in England? They have five? Uh, well, there are a number of regional... Yeah, big regional forces, forces throughout the whole with, country. With police authorities. Right. So yeah. I think someone told me there are five for the whole country. So. Uh, I don't think it's, I think it's more than that. Oh, okay. Okay. So did I answer you, answer you quite... Is it clearer to you, Madam? Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Okay, you're next. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, ben Isett, Victoria City Council. I'd like to acknowledge that the chair of the CRD is here as well, Alistair Bryson and my colleague Shelley Gudgeon, and also a number of representatives of the Oak Bay and Saanich forces. Um, I just wanted to ask the chiefs and also um, the, uh, Rob, uh, Professor Gordon, um, could the regional districts be a model for the cash flows to a single regional force or for the appointment of the civilian representatives to a police board. I had heard there might be some statutory barrier to that, but to me that seems to be a model where rather than 13 municipalities having to weigh in, we already have representatives at the regional district. Where it's, where it's been tricky, I, I can't speak specifically about the CRD, but for instance the Crest radio system, while it's a, it's a good system, we're trying to move ahead, it's a slow process, but when we go to there to make change, the Crest board are all elected officials from the municipalities and they don't always get along and uh, so that's a tricky one. Now the CRD I think it's made up also of mayors? Yeah and some and some council members. So it's tricky but it does. It, it, you couldn't begin a discussion of regionalization in the peninsula without them at the we table. For sure. right. water supply. Uh, hospital capital spending is already amalgamated so that seems to be we pay municipal contributions but it would avoid a way of having to have spats over each municipality putting in because it's an automatic formula that's already worked out through this four decade old structure. Is there anything in the way of that in legislation at this point? E even if were the only legislation to be concerned about that is unalterable would be the constitution. Right? And, and almost I, I draft this stuff. Almost anything can be changed. It's just you just need the political will and a good drafter. That's all. So okay, so uh, did I answer your question? Yeah, okay. Yeah, um, I'm sort of familiar. I, I uh, was involved in uh, amalgamating the Greater Victoria Water Board. I was appointed by the Western communities to put together a program to challenge the, the four core municipalities. I have to ask you, how did that go? Well, it worked, but the only reason why we managed to do it. And, and, and it has very much to do with policing because I can assure you that the four core municipalities did not want to give up the water board. But the fact was, was that when push came to shove, uh, we managed to conduct our own investigation into the water district. And, and uh, it, it took about 10 days or two weeks and we found over four and a half million dollars worth of vehicles which were on the books, but which had mysteriously disappeared. <laughs> In other words, <laughs> there was this fleet of vehicles which the Greater Victoria Water District supposedly had, but which they couldn't find. And they'd all been bought and paid for, but you know, they were gone. This created no, no police problem or anything of that nature. Nobody wanted to go to the police. Nobody wanted to talk about this. And, and what happened was, was the province saw that there was a big problem here and pulled the, the Greater Victoria Water District Act. And then we spent three months in the Davis Center and everybody, all, all the mayors and local politicians arguing with each other uh, behind closed doors trying to sort this mess out. And, and it was more than just vehicles missing. When we got through it all, there was a hell of a lot missing. And, and, so, and so the water went to the CRD. Uh, and, and 
I'm telling you that uh, the, the local political poobahs in this area, which have been operating for a long time, I mean, there's long, long histories of, of uh, political infighting and so on. You're talking about Victoria and Esquimalt, and, and you just go back, and, 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 and they're fighting. They don't even know what they started fighting about. They've forgotten what the fight was about. You know, they'll start back in 1920 or something like that, and the lines will be, and, and, and the local politicians, they just sort of fall into line and go along with the force of inertia. Anyway, my real question is, <laughs> is a slight change of pace, and that is it's my understanding with policing, policing generally, it will vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but about 50% of the cost goes on traffic uh, enforcement. No? How, how much are we spending on, uh, I mean, how much of the budget goes on, on traffic? Well, I, I can tell you from um, uh, the average, uh, I, I'll give you my numbers, about anywhere from 85 to 95 percent of my budget is spent on salaries and benefits. Yeah. Salaries yeah. and benefits. Now, but, I have a small, I have a traffic division no, made no, up no, of X I number do, of us. At the time, yeah, the salaries are, are being paid to people right. who, who are patrolling traffic. And if you, you add it all up, uh, Hmm? Are you talking about the revenue they bring in? No, no, no. no. I'm just talking about the cost of, 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 of policing traffic. And it just seems to me that, that why do we have to have fully trained policemen to, to look after traffic issues? Because the fully trained policemen are trained to do you know, the full range of police services, and yet traffic is sort of a... Uh, traffic enforcement is a sort of subdivision of the whole thing, and 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 there could be uh, uh, a non-police force. We may have some. We may have some traffic people in the audience. So I don't want to. Yeah. You better. Uh, you better go out the back door. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, 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 so. Uh, this would be very controversial. <laughs> to do, okay. Uh, uh, let me just give you an amalgamated traffic enforcement. No. Well, first off. First off. The, your suggestion that traffic is just traffic. It's not that big. A deal. It is a huge deal. Uh, we lose, if you look at the number of people killed in traffic accidents in this province versus gangland slayings, if we put the same amount of money and effort into it, it would make a huge difference. And, and the intricacies and the complications of traffic enforcement, everything from reconstruction, fatal accidents, the liability issues, uh, uh, the whole gamut of what's required to be an effective traffic officer requires a, as fully a trained officer as any other aspect of policing. So it, it, and, and it is a, a, a crucial stream of policing that we continue to do that. Uh, you know, unfortunately, over time, many chiefs, when budgets are tough, they reduce their traffic services, thinking it's not that big a deal. It is a huge deal. And you can just see from the IRP legislation that came out, the lives that are being saved because of the work that's been done by traffic people. It's a great... Uh, I, I'm not trying to suggest that you're, you might be misguided, but I, uh, the uh, traffic is important, honestly. Okay, right. Yeah, just so you're aware, I Again, I travel the district and talk to communities and get a, a determination of what their policing priorities are. And consistently across Vancouver Island, one and two jockeying there is road safety and drugs and related crime. So we'd be pretty remiss if we didn't focus a level of resources to address that road safety issues and all the calamities that go with the concern. But if you're just measuring cost, like dollar cost, six months worth of that activity from a traffic unit or other general investigation units looking after road safety. That, the total cost that would be gobbled up in one who done it murder investigation with all the complexities that go with that. So you know, it's not just the dollar value. That this very important criminal activity can churn out much, much more uh, resource use than that activity, which again, it's sitting up there number one and two for importance. Well, of course, you know, you, yeah, I, I realize that, that, yeah, you have a big murder investigation or something and all of a sudden you're, you're totally short-staffed and you can't meet the need, whereas traffic or something like that is more predictable. You get me? So that, so I'm that. I'm just trying to add that the, you know, we hear often in the community, I am, about traffic complaints. So it is an issue for people that live in the community. They want uh, attention paid to traffic oh, issues. And the other thing I, I, don't, I don't think we've talked about is that in this region we have an integrated road safety unit that is funded by the province and is made up of all of the departments, RCMP and all municipal departments, that patrol from north of the Malahat to S Sydney and have been very effective and the, the results of that unit are, are quite impressive. 
Yes, sir. Getting back to the dollar and cent issue and, and, and the uh, public safety issue, I haven't heard one, one comment regarding public safety. Is there more public safety if we amalgamate, or is there a, it, will there be more cooperation amongst the Peace Force and less competition? Will it enhance public safety? Um, yes, 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 and yes. Um, uh, the, um, if we try and mix the discussion about budget, uh, I, I can't tell you whether we're going to have to spend more money if we're a regional force, but I will absolutely guarantee you we'll deploy officers better and smarter. We'll go after where the offenders live and where they call home, and we, we will address more of those kinds of issues, the high crime issues that are causing us problems. So. Um, it's hard to say the budget issue, it's hard to say, but I can absolutely guarantee you from a deployment perspective, with one unified command structure, one set of eyes or a group of eyes looking over crime for the region, we will target and put our resources where the, where the criminals are and where the hot spots are that require, require targeting. We're, most police departments now are moving into a, a different style of policing and it's called targeted policing and it means you know, we accept the fact that there's a small number of offenders that commit the majority of crimes. And, and we know who they are, so our targeting units, we have a, a crime unit that simply starts with the number one and it usually takes two or three days before they pick them off and they just keep going through the list. And, okay. Yeah, but, well, yeah, that's another issue. That's, that's the court. Okay, you're wrong. Just uh, uh, two things. One's a quick comment, and I talked earlier about why is it always the police that get the uh, attention to get um, together and come under one roof. And an analogy I heard once is like the CRD um, is, is like a giant 13-room house, and each room pays its own utility bill. And the living room wants the kitchen and the dining room and the bedrooms to pay for its share of the utility room because the family lives most of the time in that room. And I, I think at some point, and it does make sense, but I, I think that what we need to do is really we need to start bigger than just the police. And although it can be a catalyst, I think we need to understand we all live under the same roof and we won't have a problem with other municipalities, people coming into the downtown core because we're all part of the same citizenry, we're all part of the same area. So it's not someone else's problem, it's our problem. And, and the other thing that I think that uh, with all due respect, the, the argument about uh, outside people coming in and causing problems and we have to pay for it. I mean, we've heard that argument you know, for you know, 25 years. I think one of the things that we should consider, and Rob, maybe I'd like your opinion on this, is right now in, in the province of British Columbia, 75% or so is policed by the RCMP as a provincial uh, police department. Of the remaining 25%, 50% is the Vancouver Police Department. So really, when it comes time to sit at the table, there's two voices that government and police services and public safety really have to pay attention to, and that's those police departments. If you're a smaller police department and you're fractured as we are locally, um, you're a very small voice. But if we had six or 700 police officers and we want to have input on, on uh, provincial policy and, and how we do things uh, in the province of British Columbia to be the best in Canada, you need to have a bigger voice. And if we're fractured like this, we won't be heard. Yeah, good points. And, and uh, it goes to the issue of how you actually administer uh, a police service, whether you call it regional or amalgamated or whatever. Um, and there are a number of new models that are emerging elsewhere that are very useful, although people will see them as being very similar uh, to health authorities, and that can be a dirty word. Mm. But um, police authorities have existed for a long, long time, and uh, we're now seeing the idea of large uh, regional police services being run by police authorities that are either appointed or elected um, and have a, a control over budget and over a wide range of administrative issues. Not operational policing, but all the uh, infrastructure that goes into actually putting police cars on the road and having police officers uh, do their job. So that <clears throat> that's a perfectly viable model. It rests very much on a semi-separation between politics and administration at the police authority level. You can't completely detach from that. Um, but it does seem to work quite well. And uh, it gets us, it's an evolution from the old idea of, of uh, police boards um, and from the old idea of watch committees and similar organizations where the community actually has some say 
uh, and some oversight with respect to its policing arrangements. So it's perfectly doable. Yes, sir. My name is Gordon Stewart. I'm a mental health uh, advocate. Um, I, I see two things. If there was a, a, a regional police force and it was in Saanich, I think it would work very well. But I also think of the citizens. If they're willing to pay for their police department and they like what they see, they don't want to lose that. I think they should be able to keep what they have. That's all. Okay. Any comments? Or all right, any other comments or questions or discussion points? Yes, sir. It's just a bit of a naive question, or a lot of people understand. No such thing. Thank you. Just a, just a simple question of, of, of man in the community. Oh, uh, a man in the community or a person, an individual in the community, uh, makes a call to the police. And they feel they need a police response and they need help. And how quickly does that help arrive? Does it arrive? Um, I know this prioritization is obviously about use of men uh, and everything else, but I'm wondering, is, are there some measurements that actually show, because I think the people in the communities are going to measure the efficiency of the police and their satisfaction with police based on how their particular needs are responded to. Yes, they, we, we measure that. We, we spend a lot of attention. Uh, Oh, I'm trying to think. Uh, I can recall in Vancouver the uh, the response time for priority one calls was uh, 13 minutes at one stage, which we, was unacceptable, and I think it's been down to eight minutes. Uh, and I think we're I, 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 the the numbers exist. I don't have them in front of me. It's all computerized. But uh, from the time a call is dispatched and the officers arrive at scene is oh, it's in the area of seven or eight minutes. But it, but don't forget, in rural areas, it's different, and yeah. through no one's fault, it's just sometimes no one's around, no one's available. I'm just wondering about taking the uh, factors that may or may not be available on amalgamated situations, where well, an amalgamation occurs, which then becomes a regional force, and if there's a change toward efficiency and more service delivered in a quicker time. Yeah, I I, I don't have those numbers, but that's something I'm sure if someone we could get someone to study this officially, uh, that that would probably be looked at. And th those statistics are available. We just don't have them here tonight. Yeah. In terms of selling the idea. Sure. The response time is an extremely important measure of police efficiency. It's one that population looks to. There's a, there's a model that follows now where uh, there's modeling techniques where many departments will examine their st statistics on a map and see where the hot spots are and if they are in a certain time of the day certain uh, then you preload uh, patrol officers in those districts those zones so they can get there all that much faster. It's just good smart policing. Uh, and there are different modeling techniques uh, now to work with citizens. Uh, most departments now have uh, crime reports, I think, dot com, or you can go on and see the crimes in your neighborhood and your community, uh, that kind of thing. So, I mean, in those areas, we, we, we're, we're, we, we all work together and we share ideas. And, and the, the, the chiefs meet, we meet um, monthly, the area chiefs here. We, uh, I chair the municipal chiefs, we meet monthly. The, all the BC chiefs and RCMP, we meet every three months. So lots of good ideas, lots of best practices shared. So it isn't about individual department. We're all colleagues and we work well together. This is a business perspective. Does it make sense? Is it a better model to, to focus in regions such as ours and the lower mainland to look at a regional solution? And, and right now the whale is on the surface. Any, yes sir. You raised the, the, the issue about, one of the, or, or about with Abbotsford and uh, Matsqui, and that, that, or I'm sorry if it wasn't you, but the, the issue of the pensions. So it, in a, whether it's a two-year planning cycle or a four-year planning cycle, let's say we're advancing this. Do you know how that worked there? Because we would, I mean, if the RCMP officers couldn't make that a transfer a reasonable one for them economically it's a huge piece to fill is it not uh, my colleagues may have more information on this but we, um, we we've entered discussions with the federal government about pension portability meaning uh, if I have a five-year uh, Victoria officer and they want to go and work for the Mounties up up north uh, they have to cash in their pension 
contributions and come buy RSPs or try and pay up front. But there is discussion, I know, to talk about this pension portability. So we just take your pension, come with a new department, and they'll accept it. But it's not. In I think an act has been tabled. I don't, Jim, do you know if the act has is, is been tabled and is resolved as far as pension portability? I thought we were very almost there. I was just, I mean, I think of the Lower Mainland and bringing, if, if this were going on and Surrey was going to be absorbed, if well, that has to exist, because well, I don't know where you'd get that many yeah. trained officers two years, four years, it wouldn't much matter. In the Matsqui Abbotsford example, back in, in the early 90, 95, I think, the, several of the RCMP members were um, transferred back to the RCMP organization in some uh, some other place, mm -hmm. and th those who chose to go over chose to go over with the conditions of uh, getting their pension contributions back and entering into a new plan. And generally speaking, those would have been uh, members on the junior side, mm -hmm. so less investment in the plan. Yeah, that's where the was easy. Abbotsford was a small little tiny municipality, less than 50 police people. And where Mats, we had 60, 70, 80. So they were able to absorb those half dozen, those dozen policemen. It was an easy transition. It was. Well, and, and there's some indication that the, some of the bigger RCMP detachments, should they decide to go with a municipal force, say, uh, say it's a 150 or 200 person detachment, the, the RCB could easily take those 200 members and just transfer them in the lower mainland to fill vacancies elsewhere. And where do you find 200 officers that you can hire quickly? It, it, it's a huge. So that's when we talked about the two or three year transition if you, you're you trying to make change. When I look at the peninsula as far as policing, I look at it like Surrey. I mean, you can see you've got Surrey, Langley, Matsqui, you've got River, River to Border. You've got the same distance as, as we have from. Downtown Victoria to the ferry terminal, and and they're they're policed by one organization. Each one of those municipalities has probably as many men as you would need to do to police the whole peninsula. Just but the, 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 only one. the the RCMP have done a masterful job around the Lower Mainland in regionalizing their services, their dog and their emergency response team. I mean, they got their act together policing. Now that's the RCMP have done that and. Here it's just different. It's different because of the nature of this, the concentration in the Southern Peninsula. But, you know, a 500 person police force in this area has, as was mentioned, the scale where A, you get listened to, um, we could finally buy the helicopter we've always wanted. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> but uh, you, you bring to the table the power of, of numbers, that's all. And uh, you, you, can, you can investigate or enter into those unique units and sections you, couldn't, you just couldn't do before. And we don't do it now. Jamie, uh, correct me, but I thought the original Police Act had the mayor sitting on it. Was the police, well, was the head of the police commission entering into some interesting areas? Now the yeah. the mayor is the chair the police, of the police board. Police board. So you'd have 13 mayors. No, well, <laughs> no. The the uh, a, a regional board would each one would appoint someone, and the chair. I'm not sure. There's discussions under the certainly amendments to the police act that might look at that again. I don't know. 13 mayors. One was bad enough to deal with 13. Okay. I don't know. Okay. And then we're running out of time. So. kind of want to feel safe and have healthy communities and there seems to be that political aspect that gets in the way so what is we as a community what can we do to get the politicians to take the risk to make some you know risky decisions and maybe decisions that aren't necessarily the most positive in everyone's viewpoints and take that risk to take the jump to work <coughs> together to create these communities that are safe and healthy for all of us Good question. Who wants to take it? My uh, my issue would be, uh, you know, I, I'm biased. I, f I fully admit it. I would ju I would be happy with a with a provincial government to say we'll study this formally. No more, just rubbing around the edges. We'll, we'll tie it. Now we've been told that's happening, and and uh, nothing is going to happen until after the election. And I know police services have that as as part of the Opal recommendation. So it's it's being looked at. Uh, 
eventually. But uh, you know, we I, I think a formal study, one way or the other, is, is it doable? Does it make sense? Is it what the people want here? Put it on the referendum at the election. Uh, those kinds of things. But you, let your voice be heard to your ele elected officials. That's my view. Well, just in a sort of a finishing comment for me, but I think um, <clears throat> to go down to go down the road. First of all, start off with a basic premise that when you end up with your completed study, that it indicates there's going to be value added by the change. Otherwise, don't change. But that study ought not, in my opinion, to be conducted by someone of political influence or political stature because there's a certain bias that goes with that. It should be someone in academia or whoever, you know, uh, that will approach it impartially, science-based, uh, ask all the questions, look at what's optimum, and somehow come up with that conclusion. It doesn't seem that that's really ever been done, even in those that have already taken place, as we mentioned earlier. So what group in academia could conduct such a, a study for that purpose and come up with the right recommendation in the end. There are studies that are done, but not for Victoria. Yeah. Okay, last question, then we'll... You're wrong, you're wrong. Well, I feel like this is perhaps putting uh, some members of the audience on the spot, but um, perhaps uh, Ms. Gudgeon or uh, Alistair Stewart from the CRD, would uh, your agencies be able or willing to entertain or, or host such such discussions would they would they be uh, an appropriate medium in which a police board or some sort of regionalization debate could be held? Okay, does anyone want to respond? Coming to events like this and hosting more events to engage the public to hear what the public has to say and then take it to council. I, I believe our council is. is not pro, but we, we have, our system is broken currently. We have to find changes and work together to make it more efficient. And I agree with what uh, Chief Graham has said tonight. So we, we are working as a council also to lobby the provincial government to get a question on the next uh, ballot on both amalgamation and policing. And the studies need to be done to find out what the most effective way to govern ourselves in a more efficient way for, for public safety and for services. Yeah, and as far as we understand, these studies do need to be brought forward by the people. It's not something that the government just does on their own. It needs to be recognized uh, from a grassroots level sure. that the general population itself is in favor of a uh, investigation, yeah. you know? Um, and it, it takes forever. So it's not something that people should really be afraid of talking about, which is what most people seem to have is fear and anxiety about talking about amalgamation because of all of the same things that we run into, but uh, you should really put those fears down and, and open up and talk about what the situation is, because the right decision is, you know, dependent on who you are, and we got to face it as a community and stop being selfish and, and, and look at what's We're right We're all for in this together, and we've yeah. got to remove the fears. The fear-mongering that's taking place currently has to stop, and, it, and yeah. I think the fears can be addressed through dialogue like we're doing tonight. That's kind of funny when people do talk about Like Here we do have a city councillor who, um, you know, is here to talk about this, and it is kind of interesting because there's oh, all those city councillors are going to lose their jobs, and they're not going to be in favor of it. I just think that's kind that's of cool. That's Bryson has to say. So. Okay. Alistair, on to you. <laughs> You're not getting off the hook. <laughs> um, so, um, I'm the chair of the CRD board, but I can't speak on behalf of the board for this because this isn't a discussion we've had at the board. So, uh, uh, but as the mayor of Central Saanich, I can tell you that, uh, um, you know, we think there is uh, value uh, on our council in terms of having conversations around uh, how we can work more closely together, and we've actually uh, raised that with the peninsula municipalities with Sydney and North Saanich. Uh, you may have heard about that recently. And uh, we're hoping to follow through with those discussions to have uh, a better understanding of what uh, the opportunities are to work more closely together, quite frankly. Um, I think we have to make informed decisions though, and uh, part of that whole process has to be getting good information. And uh, I, I don't subscribe to the fear uh, situation. I think there's value in having conversations and trying to come up with rational approaches to, to governance. So. Okay. It's a good, good position. I mean, you're, you're quite right in terms of the lack of information. Objective, independently gathered information that you can rely on to make the decision. That's tough to come by.
that's gone wrong. We can learn from that to, to make a situation in, in the South Island that's really effective. We don't have to just say, that didn't work, we're not doing it. We've got to change that, that, that outlook and go, wow, we're, we can learn from their mistakes and do it better and do it right here. Yeah, it is 30 something years ago we're talking about <laughs> yeah, some of them, right? I mean, seriously. Okay, thank you all. We're at the bottom of the hour. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming and, of course, our panelists.